What's up guys, this is Heiss, and today we have a really neat look at the operation of our train from the last weekend of operation here at the Colorado Railroad Museum, Golden, Colorado. Last weekend was Father's Day, and coinciding with that, we did an event called Colorado Power Days, where we had a car show and antique tractors and hit and miss engines and all sorts of stuff like that. But we also ran Denver and Grand Western number 491, with a bit of a fun train. We were joking all weekend that we chose violence in more than one way. As you saw in the intro clips, we put 10 cars behind 491 just for fun. Only the first four were for passengers. The rest of it was just a freight train just to have fun. And uh, it was a really fun train to operate. We had a ton of trainee firemen the whole weekend. So I only filmed a little bit because I was focusing on training new guys and everything like that. The one thing that I did film was operating this 10 car train with cameras dispersed down the train. So A, I wanted to show off the 491 running hard for you guys. I wanted to take a look at how the brake system actually propagates back down a longer train and what that does with the slack. So in this video, we're gonna have four cameras one in the cab watching the world famous Jeff Taylor operate the 491, and one camera that's two cars behind the engine. See, I'll have engine tender, passenger car, passenger car, then this camera looking at the couplers between those two. And then some more of the train, almost all the way to the back, we'll have another camera looking at the joint between the tank car and the box car, because the last two cars in the train, the box car and the caboose, had their retainers set up, which means that their air brake release was going to be delayed. And we'll get into the science of that a little bit more later. The last camera was mounted to the rear platform of the caboose, looking at the monkey tail. And the monkey tail is a special piece of pipe that we connect to the brake pipe and it's got a gauge so that the trainmen at the end of the train can see what the brake pipe pressure is at the end of the train and it also has a dump valve so that regardless of anything else in the caboose somebody on the end of the train is capable of stopping the train in the event of an emergency and so the thought with this setup is we can watch what jeff does with the automatic see what happens on his gauges and then see what happens as the slack might change down the train as he grabs throttle or grabs a little bit of automatic. And then we can see how long it takes those sets and releases to propagate all the way back to the end of the train. Let's get into it. Ready, Cody? Ready. <laughs> Getting started out of the station with this train is interesting because we're in a 28 degree curve on a one and a half to three and a half percent grade, depending right where you're at. And any adjustment you make on the throttle valve takes a little bit of time to actually reach the cylinders. So you don't want to spin the drivers, but you don't want to roll back and you got to kind of gather everything and go. And I do want to say that this train is actually long enough that I had to account for the speed of sound in syncing up the camera shots here. I synchronized everything to the whistle and then calculated how much they needed to be delayed for the footage to actually be at the same time, which is kind of a hilarious thing that a train even this short makes up to a third of a second of a difference between the front and the back of the train when you talk about the propagation of sound. Now, Jeff is running across the top of the railroad here, heading towards Noagua Water Tank. And this is the part of the railroad that does a little bit of a roller coaster. It's not a super steep grade in any direction, but you get up to the top of the split rail fence, and then you go downhill a little bit, then back up lightly. And then as you go into a turn approaching the last switch, the sharper curve bites you a little bit, and it goes a little bit more uphill, and then you fall off and go down the super steep 4%. So there's a little subtle undulation there that can be really challenging to keep everything stretched through. This go around, everything stayed nice and stretched, but here comes the big hill. So Jeff's gonna shut off and set up some air. So let's watch and see what the air system does. Jeff is operating the automatic brake valve, that big brass handle. And what he's doing is reducing the pressure in the equalizing reservoir, which then reduces the pressure in the brake pipe, which runs all the way back to the end of the train. As he sets up on the automatic, the equalizing reservoir and brake pipe gauges in the cab decrease, which starts to apply the brakes. 
But there's a delay at the rear of the train gauge. Between those two gauges, there are 10 cars, including the tender. It takes about 1.3 seconds for that air and that set to propagate all the way down to the back of the train. That gives you about an eighth of a second per car. And that's just 10 cars. So think about what happens when you've got a 100 car or 200 car long train. It starts to get a little interesting, doesn't it? The train's on the downhill in the final approach to our grade crossing where things flatten out and begin to start the climb again. And a lot of things happen here at once in terms of what the engineer has to do and actually what happened with the train itself on the video. It's really interesting to note that as Jeff's coming into the crossing, he actually bails off a little bit of independent brake. He's been braking with the engine brakes cut out, so he's just bailing off the tender behind him. But even with that, the train rolls in on him just a little bit. The whole train comes into compression, very gently, mind you, and no, I'm not picking on Jeff. Jeff is one of our finest engineers. This is just the reality of railroading that you never feel in the seat, and the passengers probably didn't feel either, but it's what's actually happening. And at that point, it's not even his fault. His engine's coming up on the flat, the rest of his train's on a pretty steep hill, and so gravity is affecting them more greatly. Not as much on the engine anymore, so the engine starts to slow down relative to the rest of the train. The train rolls in on him just ever so slightly, and then as he picks up some throttle, you can slowly see, first, we get tension again at the start of the train, and then we get tension at the end of the train. And then right after that, he kicks off the brakes and releases it, but instead of there being a long delay between the release and then when we see a change on the rear gauge, it's almost instantaneous. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So see how the caboose just came into frame right at the end of that shot? That's still barely on the flat getting onto the hill, and the 491's already partway up the hill, which means when it was at the start of the shot, the caboose and the rest of that was still on the downhill. But we saw that it got tension on it, and it didn't run back in again, so how did that work? Well, for one, Jeff was pulling the throttle open and was starting to work some steam, but he wasn't working it that hard. The secret is we're running this train with retainers. I alluded to this a little bit at the beginning of the video and I figured now would be the time to talk about them. And I gotta say, this is, I think my biggest miss in a 101 video was not including retainers in Air Brakes 101 because retainers are critical on the releasing side of the brakes. When you put the automatic brake valve into running or release and the brake pipe comes back up, and equalizes out with what the reservoirs on the cars have, it tells the brake cylinder, hey, release the pressure you have applied. That pressure then runs out of a line and goes through the retainer. The retainer has three positions. One is the exhaust position or the down position where it just lets that brake cylinder air get exhausted to the atmosphere, making that sound you've heard on some of my videos. <laughs> And then depending on the different type of retainers, there's other different flavors and things, but the general principle is you can either retain the air for longer in the brake cylinder, or you can retain a certain amount of air in that cylinder. Because when you release the automatic brake valve, it is going to release that air and then start to recharge the brakes. You can't recharge the brake pipe until you've done that. So if you're going down a long hill, like Cumbres Pass or the Saluda Grade or something like that, and you've got the brakes set up, you're starting to get to the point where you've got so much braking going on that you're starting to slide wheels, you gotta release the brakes and start over. 
But if you release the brakes, you have no brakes unless you set the retainers. So you set a certain amount of retainers, those retain that brake cylinder air and keep the brakes on for you. And so this is a really important part of mountainous railroading. And despite our mountain being very small and our railroad being even smaller, it actually helped us out with this train because the amount of times that you were undulating doing a little spaghetti, I'm up, it's down, it kept the ride really smooth, and that's why the train didn't run in this time. But we can see the difference that a retainer makes on the other side of the railroad at the top of the hill, when Jeff is working up the last of the hill, just about ready to tip over and get into the brakes. The rear of the train goes down into the bowl this time, and the speed was a little different, and the rear of the train rolls gently into the cars in front, because there's no retainer. If there's no more brakes holding them stretched, because enough time has passed that they've completely released and recharged. <laughs> Now let's talk about taking a set and releasing the train with the automatic brake valve. 491 is equipped with 6ET schedule air brakes. A lot of locomotives from this period of time have that or something a little older or very similar. So they'll function pretty similarly. But when you go into service, that position where you get the loud hiss, you're slowly reducing the brake pipe pressure by reducing the equalizing reservoir pressure through the valve and everything goes to match. You're slowly making that happen through a pretty restricted orifice. You can go faster by putting the valve in emergency, which just opens a big hole and dumps the pressure, which is why we call it big holing it. But that's not ideal and not good for the equipment and, you know, is used for emergencies. But because you're slowly, re you're slowly releasing that pressure from the locomotive's brake stand, it takes a long time for that pressure decrease to propagate all the way back. It's a very slow thing, it's a very metered thing, and the pressure has to work its way forward through a lot of small pipe and fittings down the brake pipe. That's why we saw that 1.3 second delay in between what the gauges were doing. But on the release side, when you release the brakes, increasing the pressure, it's almost instant. And I think the difference is because when you go to the running position of the brake valve, which brings the brake pipe back up to the feed valve pressure or its normal pressure. Truly release position on the brake valve actually just connects the main reservoir to the brake pipe. So normally when you release the brakes, you don't go to release, you go to running, but air brake nomenclature is just a whole pile of fun. Getting a pretty big pressure differential and a pretty big supply of air, rather than flowing through a really restricted orifice, you're flowing through a big inch or inch and a quarter pipe that's supplying a big pressure difference. And so it immediately starts pushing against all the air in the brake pipe and that pressure propagates really quickly on the release side of things. Well, the only thing left is to watch and see how well Jeff does stop in this darn thing, huh? She does not like that part of the railroad. was a beaut, nothing rolled in, everything stopped at the same time. Like I said, 
Jeff does a pretty good job. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you learned a couple things about brakes and what running along trains like.